Hi everyone and welcome to OGL Dev. My name is Itai Miri. In the previous episode, we learned how to render a single dot on the screen and today we're taking that dot to a full triangle. Now, if you've watched the previous video, you'll remember that I had a disclaimer there that that code may not work on all systems because we're still not using shaders. So this disclaimer is still in effect today, but it will get lifted on the next tutor tutorial uh, where we will have finally shaders. So uh, we don't have a lot of uh, code changes today uh, to render the triangle. So in addition to that, I've also added a section about backface culling. Let's recall the diagram of the rasterizer input from the previous episode. We use the coordinate zero by zero to render a single pixel at the center of the screen. Now we want to render a full triangle so we need to select three coordinates. Any coordinate within the range of minus one by minus one to one by one is valid. So let's select coordinates that are some of the simplest to write in this setup. We'll go with the bottom left-hand corner, which is minus one by minus one, the middle top at zero by one, and the bottom right-hand corner at one by minus one. Now, let's see the changes in the code. It is simpler to review the changes by comparing the code with the one from the previous tutorial. On the left hand side, we have tutorial number two with a single dot. And on the right hand side, we have the current tutorial. The first change is in the create vertex buffer function. The size of the array has been increased to three elements. And the array has been populated with the coordinates that we saw in the diagram, bottom left, top and bottom right. Notice that nothing needs to be changed in the GL buffer data because we're using the size of operator on the array so it is automatically updated to fit the larger array. The next change is in the render callback. The first parameter to GL draw arrays has been changed from GL points to GL triangles. The GPU now understands that it must create a triangle from every three consecutive coordinates in the bound vertex buffer object. The last parameter to this function has been changed from one to three. This is interesting. We are not telling the GPU to render a single triangle. We are telling it to render three vertices. And from the first parameter, it understands that every three vertices form a triangle. While this approach opens the door to various error checks that the driver must employ, for example, handling the case where the number of vertices doesn't divide by three, I believe that it makes things somewhat more generic when handling more complex primitive types such as triangle strips, which we will explore in the future. Now let's run the code. First, we need to go to tutorial number three directory and run build.sh here. And now we've got a tutorial here, the executable, and we can run it from this directory. And here's our triangle. Before we conclude, I'd like to review a couple of topics which are highly intertwined, the winding mode and face sculling. It may come as a surprise to you, but triangles actually have two faces, a front and a back face. This raises the question of what face to render. The answer may seem obvious when we look at our triangle. We just need to render the side which is pointing out of the screen. The other side is pointing into the screen and we cannot see it. It's like looking at someone's back. You cannot see his face. But this is a little too simplistic. Remember that in a real world application or a game, we are not interested in rendering single triangles as we do here. We want to render complete models. In case you're not familiar, this is Blender, a free and open source modeler. Every 3D object that appears in a game is constructed from a series of vertices, and every vertex is characterized by a number of attributes. The most important attribute is the vertex position in the 3D world. Such a series of vertices is called a model or a mesh, and we use tools like Blender, Maya, or 3D Studio Max to create them. It's just too complex to specify the vertices manually as we did so far. Let's add the monkey head model by calling Shift A, going to Mesh, 
and then monkey. As you can see, the model is made up of quads, and each quad is composed of two triangles lined up against each other. As we turn the model around, we can only see the side which faces us. This is the expected behavior in most cases. Why is it important not to render the triangles that are currently facing into the screen? After all, there is some mechanism in place that makes sure that the visible triangles are the ones that are closer to us and all the triangles on the other side are further away. By the way, we'll meet this mechanism in the future, so don't worry. The key factor here is performance. Models in complex games can reach many thousands of triangles and on average, about half of them are always facing away from us. This means that if, if we can quickly get rid of these 50% of the triangles, we'll save the GPU about 50% of the work. And indeed, the first step in the rasterizer is to determine whether a, a triangle is front or back facing and handle it accordingly. When we lay out the triangle vertices in a vertex buffer, we do this in some order, and that order sticks to the triangle all the way through the pipeline until it reaches the rasterizer. Let's take a look at our triangle diagram again. You can see that I've added the order in which the vertices were added to the buffer. We have the first at the bottom left hand corner, the second at the top, and the third at the bottom right hand corner. Let's imagine that this triangle is part of the monkey head model. It will be easier to see this by switching from solid mode to wireframe mode by clicking on Shift Z. For example, let's say that this is our triangle and these are its vertices 1, 2 and 3. When this triangle is somehow projected from its location in the 3D world down to the 2D screen, assuming that the monkey's head is situated at this position, the order of the vertices in the buffer will form a clockwise order in the 2D screen because we can see that the vertices are going clockwise around the triangle center. Now let's carefully turn the head around and keep your eyes on this triangle. There it is. When that triangle is facing away from us, we can see that the vertices are now perceived as going counterclockwise. This was the bottom left, it's now the bottom right, and this was the bottom right, it's now the bottom left. So the vertices are going 1, 2, and 3, counterclockwise. The order in the buffer didn't change, but since the triangle was flipped, the winding order changed from clockwise to counterclockwise. Based on whether the triangle is received as clockwise or counterclockwise in the rasterizer and the configured state of the OpenGL runtime, the rasterizer can decide whether to process it or throw it away. Now, the rasterizer doesn't really employ the visual inspection that we just did. Hardware doesn't like to work this way. Instead, it uses something like the following formula that we can see in the OpenGL specification. The sign of the result of this formula tells the rasterizer what to do with the triangle. I don't want to get into too much details at this stage. If you're familiar with vector math, you will notice that this is actually the formula of the cross product. In a nutshell, the cross product helps us find a vector which is perpendicular to two other vectors. It also helps us find the direction that the surface is pointing to. That is its usage here. We will deep dive into the cross product in the future. For now, let's see how we can configure the OpenGL runtime to perform face culling. The first thing we want to do is toggle between clockwise and counterclockwise in our vertex buffer. We do this by simply switching two vertices. Currently, we have a clockwise order, so let's switch these last two and let's also sort them. So we go from the bottom left to the bottom right and then to the top. And let's try this. Okay, so we can see that this has no effect. The reason is that by default, face calling is disabled. So let's enable it by calling GL enable. 
GL call face. Now let's run it. And we can still see the triangle. Let's reverse the order back to clockwise. Now we can see that if the order in the buffer is clockwise, the triangle is gone. And if it is counterclockwise, it is visible. By default, counterclockwise order means front facing and clockwise order means back facing. We have calling enabled and a clockwise triangle, which we cannot see. So let's tell OpenGL that we want clockwise triangles to be considered front facing and counterclockwise triangles to be considered back facing. We do this by calling GL front face with either GLCW for clockwise or GLCCW for counterclockwise. And now the triangle is back. Now when the vertices are in clockwise order, the triangle is visible and in the counterclockwise order, it is gone. Exactly the reverse. The last thing we can play with is to decide whether front-facing triangles are to be called or back-facing ones. The OpenGL spec allows us full flexibility on this issue as well. By default, back-facing triangles are called, but we can use GL call face, and the parameter is GL front, in order to call front-facing triangles. So now our clockwise triangle which was front face and visible is now called because we are calling front facing triangles and showing only the back, back face ones. Now let's change back to counterclockwise order. And our counterclockwise triangle, which is currently considered back facing because we called front face with clockwise, is now visible. Whew, that was a bit complex, huh? If you're still not sure, simply go ahead and play with the code like I did, and I'm sure everything uh, will settle down okay. Now, remember that uh, backface calling is usually enabled in most uh, real-world application in games, and Blender and the other modeling tools like Maya, 3D Studio Max, whatever, they are always consistent. So they will output vertices in either clockwise or counterclockwise order. In some cases, it can be, it can be configured. So uh, you need to know your tools and um, uh, get your application code working accordingly. So um, get some rest because in the next episode, we're going head to head against shaders and the programmable pipeline. So uh, thank you for watching and I will see you soon.